good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Nicola Gretton. I am Digital and Learning Innovation Manager at the University of Leicester. And um, I'm going to be talking about something that we did to um, help our staff and our students throughout the pandemic, which was integrating Microsoft Teams into our virtual learning environment, which is Blackboard. But I think there'll be lots of takeaways for everybody, even if your VLE isn't Blackboard. Um, I'm delighted, hopefully, that in the virtual audience somewhere are my colleagues, Rachel, uh, Lizzie and Martin because this was very much a strong collaborative piece of work between my team and digital services colleagues so towards the end when we get into the discussion um, hopefully we can draw on their expertise as well and cover all questions so as I say what I'm going to be presenting is what we did why we did it what we found out give you a few uh, case studies through different disciplinary lenses and then hopefully open up to quite an interesting discussion, one that I'm thinking about at the moment for sure, which is where does Microsoft Teams sit within a digital learning environment ecosystem? What role does it have to play? Is it really a, a contender and can compete with some of the other educational products? So just very quickly to give you a sense of the size and shape of Leicester. So I work at the University of Leicester. I'm also a code fellow. So when the pandemic started, it was really important that we made sure that staff and students could still connect, that they were still getting all the rich benefits that they normally get from being on campus, that peer-to-peer -peer learning, the serendipitous moments of bumping into people and making sure that the digital environment wasn't creating any barriers to learning and engagement. So what we did was we decided, obviously Teams was being used a lot to help uh, staff and students with learning and teaching online and that quick rapid pivot to online learning. And we decided that actually Teams was um, already being used quite a lot at the university. So we would harness those affordances, but we were mindful of the fact that within Teams, uh, a lot of the information is assigned to an individual. So if you leave the university, there's potential for your content and your chat feed and different things to disappear with you. So we looked into integrating Teams into Blackboard and through the wonderful wizardry of digital services. And what you can see here is a web part that one of the team, Martin, generated, is we allowed people to be able to operate this for themselves. So what we did is is we have a Blackboard course site for every module and we created a linked team space for every Blackboard module that we had. So it just sits there in the background, resting, ready for when somebody wants to engage and create a new online room and a new online space for uh, their staff and students. So they go to our internal uh, homepage, they see this web part, and what you would have here is the course code and the name of the Blackboard course site that you are an instructor of. And if you see the little symbol here, it means that the Teams site is active. And if you see this one next to it, it means students are also flowing in to this new online space. Here, you see this is a future Blackboard course site. So everything is driven from Blackboard. So if you're an instructor on a Blackboard course site, you'll be an owner on the team site. If you're a student on the Blackboard course site, you'll be a member of the uh, associated team site. So it's all driven from Blackboard. So at the top here where you see current, previous and future, this is a tab we have in Blackboard that categorizes my Blackboard course sites. So current means current academic year, previous is previous academic year, and future are the Blackboard course sites that we get ready for the forthcoming academic year. So people can work on them and get ready. So at the moment, I've got my team site for the future Blackboard course site. I can be setting that up, but I haven't let my students come through into that new space yet. So if I wanted to uh, create the team space, so sort of open the door between these two spaces, I would click on the manage button and that would take me through to another web part. 
This would show me how many owners there will be on the team site. Now, as I say, it's driven from Blackboard. So this Blackboard course site has 19 instructors on it, which is probably way too many. And I'll cover that in a few moments. It tells me what the um, term is that that Blackboard course site is running in. This is an old screenshot. So now that would say 2122. And then I can say, create my team. And this takes about 24 hours to, so there's a, a daily sync. My team site is then available to me. I can start to work on that, setting up groups and, and different things that I want. And then I can come back to this page and there would be a button that would say, sync my students. And my students would then have access to the Blackboard course site and the team site. So to help our students as well to find their way around this online environment and these new spaces that we were created, we also made sure that staff could ask timetabling to um, put in synchronous online sessions into the student's timetable. So this would have details of the session. And then when they click on this link from their timetable, so learning materials and activities, they would then go through to the Blackboard course site for the module. And there'd be this lovely little banner on the landing page, which would have a link to that timetabled synchronous online session. So that's something we did to try and help the student movement through this new part of our digital learning environment. Now we would have loved to have been able to take them straight into that team site, but we do have other applications in our digital ecosystem for online events. And we weren't sure during that first year of the pandemic, which tool people would be using. So this was our way to, to navigate that. So is it working? Well, in that first year, I think Microsoft realized, you know, people were using the application differently. There were features they were developing and trying to sort of keep pace with, with other competitors. So there were things to begin with that weren't working for us, but have since moved forwards for our integrated teams for teaching. So some of the issues I'm sure you're very aware of. So there weren't breakout rooms to begin with. So it was hard to manage group work and, and other uh, ways that people wanted to use the space. But one of the things I touched upon before when I said we had 19 people as instructors on a Blackboard course site, that would mean you'd have 19 owners in your team site. And it means each one of them would be getting all of the notifications that you get from teams. And that did not please people very much at all. Because a lot of people on a Blackboard course site, they may have perhaps an administrative role or a different sort of function within the team space. And they most definitely didn't want to be over in this new classroom that we'd linked and created this sort of movement between the two spaces. So we used a different role in Blackboard called the coordinator role. That way people could retain the privileges and the functions that they needed in Blackboard, but not move across into the team space and sort of die down some of that traffic. So um, some of the other issues that came up in that first year, um, they weren't technical issues. They were, these were changes in behavior. So we realized that students weren't able to move themselves between breakout rooms. So we started to uh, work with academics to change their practice and think about setting up things in advance. Also, we found out that, of course, if somebody, if a student went into the meeting and um, they started the meeting, then they got the recording for the session. That wasn't something we wanted either. So again, we work with academics to think about those settings and make sure that it was only me or designated presenter. So in that first year, there was quite a lot of learning to be done um, and working with academics so that they felt digitally confident and a little bit more resilient about this new part of the infrastructure. So usage and benefits. In that first year, obviously, that was different to the second year that we've been running. Teams for Teaching is what we call the integration between Teams and Blackboard. We found that uh, what was being fed back to us, because when somebody clicks that button to say, I'd like to activate my team, please, they get automatically enrolled into another team site. It's a community site where everybody could work together, share ideas. It's where we could make announcements and work really closely with the community. So that's been a really, really useful source of information and evaluation during the first year. 
And what was being reported back was the anonymity. Students really enjoyed the chat function, the whiteboard. It was a chance for them to contribute in a way that they felt comfortable as they found their voice within the online environment. It was absolutely fantastic for accessibility, so the captions, transcripts, but the live captioning. Now, I'm, I'm um, partially deaf and I rely quite heavily on accessibility features. And even though this isn't part of what we're finding in the move to online learning, sharing documents was very powerful and collaborating on that. And what we've done with that integration is we're able to have documents there that are in a read only mode. So there's different ways that we're, we're using content and, and doing um, co collaboration and, and co content creation. Obviously, we were using it for asynchronous and synchronous teaching, and it was creating a great deal of discussion, which was fantastic. So then going into our second year, we saw um, a growth of people activating their, their Teams enabled sites by 20%. So a lot more people were engaging in this new part of our digital ecosystem. Primarily, it was being used by third and fourth year students and um, in the main areas were physics, law, and we've seen engineering come online a lot more now as well. So just to give you a few disciplinary lenses over this, um, education, they did, I mean, they were the most transformative. This is where digital really did transform academic practice. So what they decided was Blackboard's role would be for asynchronous learning, and then synchronous learning would be in the team space. And because this particular program director was over a campus-based and a DL program, they started to blend their cohorts. So the team's integrated space allowed them to bring DL and campus-based students together, creating a really rich learning experience and a sort of a worldwide classroom. She was able to share some of the uh, sessions as we moved them back into more of a hybrid of campus-based and online learning. She would record some of the sessions she was doing on campus or bring students in and, and work in parallel with them, again, bringing in DL and campus-based. DL students felt they were really connected now to the university and the campus-based students were really benefiting from the experience of their DL peers. There were lots of efficiencies it created as well because she was able to bring the staff and the students into the sessions she was doing on how to use the team space. So that saved her a lot of time and it's really gone on to change her practice and that of the course team. They've seamlessly moved into hybrid learning and teaching, and some of her colleagues have gone on to get reward and recognition for the changes in their practice. In the School of Law, they had a lot of students who could not return to campus, so they did um, an awful lot of teaching online, but their takeaways and what they're moving forwards now into the next academic session with is they found it a great tool for in-lecture participation, better than some of the other tools we have in our ecosystem. They found student societies, really large student societies, were moving into this space and will continue to do so. It was fabulous for group work, and is going to reduce the amount of broadcast lectures um, that they did before the pandemic and as they go into the new academic year 22-23. But it was the normalisation as well. So they really, because they'd used Teams um, for sort of meetings and other things before the pandemic and then really heavily for learning and teaching, they are now holding hybrid meetings. And as I say, their students are taking their societies into this space. So they really feel like the integration is normalising practice into a, a new way, a bit of a, a paradigm shift for them. Physics and astronomy, uh, they really went in for the sharing of documents. That was incredibly helpful, especially for final year projects, for presentations, co-creation of content. And one of the interesting takeaways for them was using it um, as a careers bulletin board. So they find sort of communicating with their cohorts um, really, really effective through this new space that we've added onto the Blackboard side of our digital ecosystem. So what will we do next? Um, I think we really, really do see the benefits for communication, collaboration, 
live online events, but also personal tutoring was a really interesting development over the last two years. Students find it much easier to, I think, have open conversations with their tutors using the chat channel. Um, also, personal tutors are keeping sort of a shared document of the notes between their tutees using the integrated spaces and, and teams and its more ad hoc nature, which we also offer as well. So definitely we'll be building on that. We see that's part of its definition in our DLE ecosystem and what it brings. We'll start to think about assessment because we haven't really looked into that yet. But Blackboard is still very much where that's the sort of more formal voice of the institution is where we put confidential information, restricted data, it's where summative assessment takes place. So that's still very much a core part of our digital learning environment. And we've started to think really now about, well, what would we do? We've done two years as a pilot now. Those who got on board with that tend to be the more digitally resilient, but there's a lot of other people who are still on the periphery of using this, and we want to know why that is. So we've got quite an extensive evaluation, which Rachel's doing this summer. So we'll be using the JISC Insights tool uh, to get more data because we're piloting that at the moment. We've got our community. We'll start to get into structured interviews, focus groups with students to really think about defining its position in our DLE what we think the, the affordances are for teaching and learning, and could it indeed change the ecosystem more? We're not sure because obviously you're quite often at the hand of Microsoft, you know, you blink and there's a new feature or there'll be something else that's come on board. And there's a lot to manage there, especially for those who are less digitally um, sort of confident. We're mindful of that. So there's a lot that we're thinking about at the moment, a lot more information to come. But I'm really interested in what other people have found um, if they've been using Teams. I mean, there's a lot of traffic at the moment as to whether, especially in digital services teams within institutions, that this is the new digital learning environment. This could be a VLE competitor. So I thank you very much for your time. Hopefully I've kept to time um, and uh, I hand back over to Leonard and welcome questions and comments. Thank you, Nicola. That was that was great. I, I really enjoyed that. And I think we got a lot of engagement from people. So going in reverse order, one of the, the questions from Melanie uh, um, was uh, regarding um, uh, ST interaction, I'm not sure that is. Is there a, a pen function like it, there is in Collaborate? Um, uh, now with Teams meeting sessions, as I find that there to be a very important function enabling students to annotate whatever I share on screen. Do you know if there's a pen function? A pen function within Teams. You know, now, like I'm hoping, yeah. I mean, we, we do obviously have those in our um, physical spaces. So you can annotate and, and capture all of that. And people are using the whiteboard a lot. I, I believe you can collaborate that way. I'm hoping that my colleagues are on the call. This is sort of at the joint presentation uh, part of it. So I don't know, Rachel, are you here? I am, hi. <laughs> Lovely, great. So Rachel's a member of my team. So if you wouldn't mind just uh, elaborating, that'd be great. Yeah, as far as I know, I think there is a pen. If you're doing, um, if you've got a PowerPoint, you can annotate that within Teams if you're presenting. And then there's also, as somebody's commented as well, you can use the whiteboard within a Teams meeting as well. So if you wanted to do a collaboration or um, sort of brainstorming activity with everybody being able to write on the screen with the pen, then yes, you can. Thanks, Rachel. Um, another. It, it wasn't a question, but I think a comment worth sharing to invite you to comment on in turn from Steve, who I know has a lot of experience with teams, said that we found the, the person individually owns things, quote unquote, permissions, documents, recordings, uh, often a problem to manage within VLE environments, which are usually uh, module program team based. I assume that you mean, Steve, that um, this is a problem in VLEs and it's less of a problem in teams? Um, I think probably the other way around is that, you know, 
we're so used to the fact if somebody leaves, we can add somebody else onto the VLE as a, as a teacher or something like that. We've got a sort of central management of those things. Whereas if they leave and the recordings disappear, or as you mentioned, the chat disappears, there's less ownership to kind of put that back together. Yeah, absolutely. That's why we did the Teams integration. So integrating it into Blackboard. So in terms of management permissions and privileges. So SITS is our um, student record system that drives the enrollment into Blackboard and then Blackboard drives into Teams. So if somebody does, so if somebody left, we're not losing anything in the way we would if we use Teams in what we were calling our sort of ad hoc mode, the sort of standalone way that we're used to using it in our professional life. So um, as long as somebody's an instructor on the Blackboard course site, they're a team member, but that content gets retained. So that was one of the important facets of the integration because we didn't want to have those vulnerabilities that you've you've outlined there. We also have a question just now from uh, Steve uh, Warburton, um, which uh, I think you referred to in your presentation. He says, what about accessibility? Uh, there are challenges here that have created reluctance by some institutions to move fully to teams. How do you, how do you feel about that? I don't know if Steve wants to come in. I noticed. Uh, yeah, I'm here. no, it's an interesting one because we, we are, we've looked at teams integration as well. We looked at team, in, well, I'm in Australia, so we're looking at Moodle here. Uh, but one of the issues is certainly from a technical one is around the accessibility issues with teams that have been ongoing and have been challenging. So some institutions have ridden through those using policy instruments and others are looking at sort of technical solutions. I wondered if you come up, I'm sorry, I missed the start of the talks if you covered it. I was really interested in what, if you had an approach around accessibility and ensuring that. And the other side of the question is actually, how do you moderate the way that students might use Teams apps as well? It's a very free form environment when you move into Teams. How do you restrict students just putting in all the apps they want to and how you switch them on and off? Yeah, thank you. I'll take the second part first, if that's okay. And I may ask um, some of my digital services colleagues if they want to chip in with that, because we have a sort of rollout policy. So we have different rings. So we have ring zero, which is when all the exciting new stuff is there. And we have a look at that and we evaluate it. And then we have, then we sort of work out in, in circles um, when to bring other people in to a point when we then get some of our sort of digitally really confident academics to be perhaps piloting it. Sometimes we feel it's something that can just roll out across the board, but we sort of do try and take that sort of pedagogic practice lens to what we're doing there, because obviously Microsoft are pulling levers and pressing buttons and things like you say, it's very dynamic and we work in an agile way. So the interdisciplinary team, we work, we use the sprint agile methodology so that we are keeping pace but we're still getting that level of criticality over it so um that's how we're sort of managing some of that that sort of free-for-all nature and we have different flavors of teams as well so this is the integrated one with blackboard but then we have what we call teams for collaboration so there's student-owned teams that are outside of that but that is monitored through policy and we also have the same for staff. Um, in terms of accessibility, we found it was um, a much stronger product really against some of the other competitors because they do have the live captions, which although it's not part of the UK kind of legislation around that, the live captions are great. Uh, the captions, the transcripts. Obviously, there was a bit of an issue recently with the migration of stream from classic to new stream, we were calling it, but that seems to be um, resolved now. But I will very briefly just ask uh, if Lizzie, Rachel um, in particular, has anything you want to add to Steve's question? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I can um, briefly talk about how we do the Office 365 app um, so we look at with teams and we kind of have a, a scheduled meeting every, I think it's every quarter, um, depending on how many uh, new things um, Microsoft have turned on. Um, so we used to be a lot less dynamic with this. But now, um, although we uh, we put in a policy where things, when they come into the environment, are turned off by default, we're very regularly looking at these um, and deciding whether 
um, like Nick says, whether they need any level of kind of governance, whether they can just go straight through, whether we want to pilot them with some people, um, whether we want to, um, so for example, we uh, had this week, in fact, literally on a post-it note in front of my face, um, <laughs> the, there's a walkie-talkie app in Teams that we didn't think necessarily anyone would particularly need, but actually we've been requested to um, trial it in terms of um, confirmation clearing. Um, some of the guys in digital services wanted to use it just between themselves. So we're gonna um, just make it available for those guys um, in the next couple, well, I'll do that today. <laughs> um, so they've got a couple of weeks just to try it and see if it is gonna meet their needs. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but yeah, we, we do the same. Obviously there's a lot of things in there which are just uh, not uh, appropriate for our environment. So we have, there's an app in there called Parents um, which I think uh, I'm not sure what, exactly whether it's uh, picking up on your student doing their, their homework or I don't think it's appropriate for a university situation. So that one's staying off until until we get a request to look at it otherwise. Um, but I hope that answers the question a bit. It, it does. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Both. Um, perfect. Uh, we're, we're just out of time right now. And so uh, it's time for our next speaker, Judy, who will be talking about animated simulation of polymerization reactions in bilingual online teaching. Mm, hi, uh, I'm teaching animation related programs at the School of Political Science and Law, uh, the Open University of China. Um, my partner, Professor Ming Li from Hubei University uh, is a project leader and uh, the co-corresponding also of our people. The research was funded by the National Na uh, Nature Science Foundation of China and the teaching construction project of Hubei University. It could be better uh, understood how animated simulation of uh, polymerization reactions in uh, bilingual online teaching. Well, please, please Linda. Thank you. Polymer chemistry is one of the core courses of chemistry programming, chemical engineering, and uh, uh, material related uh, programs. The reaction mechanism of polymer chemistry is hard to be understood due to its complexity, especially in the um, bilingual. Um, online teaching, students have a difficult cultural background, professional background and English proficiency. So uh, it is uh, difficult for them to understand through the traditional teaching. Next page, please. Linda. Linda, uh, thank you. Well, um, compared with the uh, chemical and terminology, the form of image and uh, animation is easier to be perceived. Through animation technology, the course content can be visualized, which is uh, conducive to getting students to quickly understand the knowledge point, thus uh, enlightening the associative power and enhancing the teaching effect. In, the, in this study, um, multimedia software such as uh, 3D Max and Blender were used to simulate the um, polymerization mechanism in the form of animation. Next take please, Linda. Next one, please. Is this the right one, Judy? Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, it's uh, the examples of, of this uh, study, but uh, I will introduce the later content. Okay. So the next page, please. Yeah. I, I love the I love the diagrams though. Yeah, I mean, I like my partner to introduce the example for for you guys. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
uh, compared with the traditional teaching methods, the use of animation simulation can improve students' learning efficiency and uh, participation. Yes, please. Strengthen students' understanding and uh, enhance the retention of the content in their long-term memory. For example, in the experimental class, 19% of students can recall the lesson's content, while less than 50% in traditional teaching class. A week later, 60% of students had a fairly com complete record of the lesson's content, while less than 20% in traditional class. So research shows that students have a better understanding of the content of uh, animations that are easy to be handwriting, while it is difficult for students to understand the content of animations with many details and complex structures which should be pay attention to in the process of animation presentation. This study not only provides a clue for, clue for realizing the visualization of the content of um, bilingual online teaching in a multicultural background, but also can be used for teaching uh, difficult knowledge in in courses by traditional teaching. Uh, that's all, thank you. Uh, okay, I, I look forward to discuss about this study with you to further details. Well, Linda, that's all. Thank you very much, um, Ju, that was very interesting. Um, really uh, impressive to see the, um, the difference in terms of the students' um, recall. Did you ask them any um more, any questions um about it as well or was it was it just purely the results that you looked at or did you um did you also get any kind of feedback from them comments from them well um okay i well uh so so uh, Professor Ming Li is, uh, is also here. So he's the leader of this pro project. Uh, can we uh, let him to uh, answer the question? He should just be able to turn his mic and his camera on, Judy. So if he's with us, Professor, do please join us to contribute. Hello. Hello. Hello, Mimi. everyone. Yes. Hello and welcome. So what I was asking was, did, what was what did the students have to say about the um, about the animation based learning? Because we've seen the results were very good, but did they give any feedback? I think the animation is much better for students to understand. The, because for the, uh, tradition, the traditional teaching, it is very difficult for them to understand um, the basic and uh, the principles of chemistry. But for the animation, the animation is uh, like uh, we, we use the babies and the children and uh, different peoples to mimic different uh, uh, different um, reactions and uh, the, so as to make students to be more easy to understand. Mm. Thank you. I was actually thinking um, during the presentation, it would be what would be really interesting, maybe, you know, I don't, I don't know the, the level of difficulty, but what might be fascinating would be for students to create their own animations. Have you thought about this possibility? Sorry, I cannot not understand, understand your question. I was wondering, maybe students could create their own animations. Do you think that would be possible if they had some? I advice? think uh, it is possible the students can make their own animations. If they can, it will be better. Actually, we also uh, encourage students to uh, open their mind and to use their own animations to depict what they are thinking and uh, what they have already uh, got from the lectures. 
Great. So, yes, uh, we, we will uh, finish the demo design maybe next year. Fantastic. Um, I'm just checking the, to see if that we have any further questions. Do uh, anybody um, want to jump in and ask anything? We do need to stick to our timing. So if there's no further questions now, I think we'll move move on. Thank you very much. That was uh, really interesting. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I think I think Leo, you're right. It was really interesting to see how it illustrated the way in which um, you can cross language and understanding barriers just by using animation tools that we can all relate to. Because when you see the pictures of the chemicals, <clears throat> it seems very intimidating. But when you see the pictures of people, children, adults, families, and so on, it just breaks down the complexity considerably, doesn't it? Mm, yeah, I agree yeah. that the, the diagrams were lovely. I, I think Professor, uh, Professor Ming Li could uh, explain, uh, explain the example of the two pictures about, how about that? I think we, we probably don't have time now, Judy, because we need to speak okay. move on to our next live. Yeah, okay. But thank, we'll you yeah. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Belinda. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. And so uh, now I would like to welcome Helen, um, who is going to tell us about um, virtual appointments, an invaluable tool to bridge the distance in distance learning. So this sounds fantastic. Welcome, Helen. Hello. Um, just to say that Leo and I seem to be in the, in the same spot, but it's just that we're working it for the same institution. And um, let me introduce myself. I'm Professor Helen Zanthaki. I'm the Dean of PG Laws and I'm based at UCL. Uh, please allow me to present my co-presenter, uh, Jo Tapper, who will introduce herself. Hi there, my name is Jo and I'm the Program Officer for PG Laws. So Helen and I work in partnership on our program together. Okay, so by way of, of uh, just an introduction before Joe starts, um, the PG Laws program is a purely distance learning program um, run by the University of London and academically led by UCL and QMUL. Um, we have about two and a half thousand students over 68 courses. So the reason why we're using this as a case study is to illustrate that even under critical circumstances, um, which is a huge number of students from uh, diverse jurisdictions with varied understanding of technology, one-to-one -one virtual appointments can really be an invaluable tool to bridge the distance in distance learning. So Joe, over to you. Great, thank you. Um, shall I move to the next slide? Okay, so just to talk a little bit about, again, about PG Laws as a case study. So the virtual appointments that we will be talking about today, we have run over 280 of them in the past year between Helen and myself. And looking at those appointments, we've been able to split them kind of roughly into three categories. Um, so we have academic appointments, which function kind of quite close, I would say, to what a standard personal tutor appointment would be. And Helen leads on those. We have administrative appointments, which I lead on, which tend to be mostly troubleshooting in nature. So students will come to us when they have a slightly more complex query that they would benefit from discussing directly with us or just any run of the mill query that they want to be talked through really, I think is quite helpful. And the third category that we've identified is a more targeted kind of appointment. So we target these during the student life cycle, such as specific mentoring appointments after exam results come out or support for students who may have had a break and are returning to study. So those are the three kind of main categories that we've identified. And I think it's important as well to say that all three kind of appointments do quite often have a pastoral nature that is underlying them that can come in and of course that there can be some kind of um, some kind of blending between the three we quite often find as well so um, we um, thought when we started that this would be a good way of bridging the gap in distance education especially um, within the pandemic uh, we were warned that it would not be realistic and this has not been our experience but let's start with key benefits of the appointments um 
as expected, they addressed most issues that are identified by Gillis and Krull. So they did bridge the distance in distance education. They did enhance a sense of community for our students and ourselves. Um, they did maximize engagement, especially within a COVID disrupted educational environment. They did recreate and maintain informal and constructive relationships online for one-to-one -one interactions. Now, the question is, how did we do that? Well, first of all, um, I think it was quite crucial for students to see that there was a visible, obvi obvious, relevant and accessible um, uh, channel of guidance. And this was all the more important within a period of time where um, the university was uh, bursting <laughs> um, and it seems both because the demand from students was much, much higher than normal, but also because of staff absences during the pandemic. Um, so it was important for us to be able to offer our students a very easy way of getting an immediate or very quick answer as far as we could, as quickly as possible. We also found that they changed the way in which we communicated with our students. And I mean, as you can see, both Joe and myself are quite open and informal in our type of communication. But um, quite a few students, especially from um, different educational uh, environments, found um, the experience of speaking with a professor and the dean quite formal. Um, whereas with the uh, one-to-ones, I was able to take this at a completely informal level on a first um, uh, on a first name basis, and we were able to discuss quite um, a range of issues, ranging from yes, their study and purely academic issues to, as Joe said, um, pastoral issues. A lot on on a on a on quite a personal basis. Their their um, experiences with COVID, their issues, um, and also by introducing this indirect channel, informal channel of communication between us and students, students themselves got together and they created an informal level of communication between them. So I often had somebody um, ringing me up in the virtual environment to talk to me about somebody else and how I should be there to assist them, which I, I think is absolutely great. It's something that I hadn't experienced before um, in distance learning. Um, in that respect um, and in this way, one-to-one um, -one appointments also empowered the student's social presence. Um, and I'm referring to the community of inquiry framework. Um, so we finally found um, the key to unlocking um, the um, reluctance of students to go online and the reluctance of students to open up online on issues other than purely their studies. And I think what is quite important also, and we see this happening a lot, these one-to-one -one appointments established an enhanced sense of trust in us. Um, so um, it became obvious to students that whatever they shared was confidential, that we were on their side, and that we were there to provide as quick a solution as possible. Um, and I think that sense of trust both in us as functions, not people, but also as um, in our institutional role, but also in the solutions that we offered uh, benefited both students and also ourselves. So this was more or less expected. What was unexpected is was what Joe will tell you now. Okay, so some things that we found unexpected but really key benefits. Um, as Helen says, we may have been warned at the start that this was an unrealistic method of, um, of, of you know, of working. But in fact, um, I'm here to tell you it's not so scary. They actually saved us time and resources was what we found, because if you can identify a problem or a potential problem that is brewing with a student and you can quickly solve that, you can reach out to the relevant teams that you need to following that conversation, um, then actually that will save you time in the long run. So it can feel like quite a commitment to put in your diary, but actually we have found that they are saving us time and resources, definitely. It's also become another really key strand of feedback for us from our student community. So that operates alongside our brilliant student staff liaison committee and our more sort of general surveys that we run. We have also been able to identify underlying, you know, sort of common problems that we might be finding within our student community and to nip them in the bud 
I think a lot faster when they keep coming up in online appointments, you know, there's an underlying problem going on there. So we found it a really useful strand of feedback to add to our bow in that sense. And they've allowed Helen and I to kind of work as the dean and the program officer to work on student casework together again to kind of come to solutions that we may find by discussing obviously anonymized appointments between ourselves. We can again look at general problems within the student community or to solve individual problems quicker. So I think they've been really helpful on those three really practical levels for us. So some things that we have found in terms of how do we optimize the appointments? How do we make them as useful as we can? Um, we've found that we have to keep the frequency of appointment advertising quite high in order to make sure that students are aware of the resource. I think that's always the battle with distance learning when you've got a virtual learning environment that is bursting with resources. How do you make sure students are aware of that support that's available? So we advertise them on a monthly basis. And if any new appointments are released as they get booked up, we'll also advertise that as well. So we try to, without bombarding the students, keep them always visible in their periphery. The visibility of appointments on the VLE is also something that we've tried to increase. So you can find links to our booking calendar in several different places across the VLE, including a very large button that says contact us. So we've tried to make them as visible as possible for any student who may be looking for that support. We've also found it important, important to clarify the purpose of the different appointments. As I talked about the three kind of different kinds of appointments that we've identified, we try with students to be quite clear. For example, with administrative issues, we will say to them, look, the, your ideal port of call, first of all, is the university student inquiry service. If you're struggling, if it's complicated, then please do come to us. And similarly, with being very, very clear about the purpose of post-exam appointments, these are for you if you need some mentoring, some advice after your exams. If it's a more run-of-the-mill personal tutor that you want, please do not book this kind of appointment. So I think we've managed to get our language just about right now in terms of the clarity of the different kinds of appointments. And we're seeing that in the questions that students are bringing to us in our appointments. And I think that's really key for their success. Helen, do you wanna talk about the appointment time? Uh, and of course, to to address the issue that Leo was bringing up, which is time, uh, we limited our appointment time and we do have a clock that sort of counts down. And that, I think, um, sort of protects us and makes sure that we uh, um, have the time allocated where it's sort of GPs uh, behaving at that, at that in, the, in this instance. But also it enhances student self-efficacy um, with shaping a conversation because they get straight onto the point. Um, and that is quite helpful. Absolutely. I'm so sorry to, to interrupt, but I think we've kind of run out of time for the for the current presentation. Helen and Joanne, this has been so good. And uh, I think everyone will look forward to having a look at your at your slides. Um, but could I could I ask you to maybe just check the comments in the chat and maybe respond there so that we could move on to our next speaker. But thank you very much. That was fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you. So I'll just leave this final slide up. That's just got some quantitative and some qualitative data that we came up with. So I'll just leave that there. Thank you, Joanne. OK, well, first of all, thank you to the ride organisers uh, and to the, uh, to the audience for, for listening today. Um, my name's Ambrose Cole and I'm a learning designer at Coventry University and I've been with the university since 2018. Um, I develop processes and produce online courses, and I, I work closely with, with the academics um, through the entire process of our course, course development. Um, I'm not here today um, to describe a new technology, but rather I want to explain to you how we've made use of specialist teams in our course development process, working in close collaboration with each other. Um, I want to discuss some of the difficulties that we've faced and, and how we've overcome some of these. So what did the university aim to do? Um, the university wanted to widen participation in, in higher education. Um, it wanted to deliver learning that was uh, for those people who were unable to access the normal campus-based education, hence via an online route. Um, but they wanted to make and produce flexible learning that students could uh, access on very much their own terms. And in order to do this, Coventry University Online has brought together teams of specialists uh, to support academics in this production process. So why put these big expensive teams together? Well, the simple reason for this is that making online courses is hard, um, especially when the majority of that content is to be delivered asynchronously. Um, you want to make these courses engaging, easy to navigate, concise, accessible, active, and even interactive. But we also want to build broader skills within the student cohorts that we're teaching. 
And for small non-specialist teams, this can be a tall order. But by bringing together a broad set of specialists and making best use of their skills, we've been able to support and produce multiple varied courses at speed. Something that's proved particularly useful when everything pivoted to online delivery in the last few years. So what do our production teams look like? Well, firstly, we have the academics. These are the subject matter specialists, but also they have previous knowledge of teaching, uh, of, of the teaching their students. And this is important to create and deliver courses that fit the students that we're aiming to teach. Secondly, we have project managers. Um, th these people keep tabs on our progress and assess the risks of the projects as we're working forward. And this has proved, these have proved a real asset when we're working on multiple courses at the same time, as we do. We also have media producers, and these obviously make the visual content, but they also offer advice on things, areas such as scripting and of the various production options which are available. They can turn around things that can take an inexperienced user days to produce, but simply in a matter of hours. And finally, we have the content specialists, of which I'm one. And we work with the academics to, to improve the flow and structure of the courses, developing engaging activities and making sure that the written content is understandable, concise and accessible. But for these teams to work effectively, they need to work well together. And this is something that we've aimed to improve as we've grown. So what challenges have we faced in terms of team development? Well, there's a potential friction that occur regarding roles. The academics, often newcomers to our teams, are coming across from faculty. And I imagine, if you will, a first meeting where, where potentially there's one academic sitting in the room and five members of Compton University Online appear. This is possibly quite a daunting experience. And there's a real risk of an us and them mentality being created, with the knowledge of the academics somehow being degraded, diluted or disregarded. And this will obviously detract from the potential advantages of that collaboration. And, uh, which collaboration can bring to the table. Secondly, there's also time. There's always a question of time and resources. It takes time to produce courses in both terms of planning and production. If there's not space given to, to develop the assets or, or courses, then problems will occur. The plans for your, for your course must be realistic. And if there's confusion around expectation, these processes can unravel quickly. To deal with these, we've spent time improving both our onboarding processes and our production processes so that we know at every stage what is, what is, um, what, what is to happen. So how do we ensure that our projects start on a sound footing? Well, firstly, everybody needs to be ready. Without the initial stages taking place, it's very hard to make sure that everybody fully understands the requirements. But it's important not to overload newcomers in the first meetings. We know this already as experienced educationalists. We found it's best to start by listening, to get an idea of the experiences, fears, and needs of the academics that we're working with. No project is the same, and no academic is the same, and their support needs vary. To better offer this, we're, we're developing resources that will help bring newcomers up to speed gradually and give help when and where it's needed. But it's important to give an outline of the stages of the process at the very beginning. A simple handbook with an overview of this process can help. It's very important during these initial meetings that we develop a shared sense of responsibility for the project that we're all about to embark on. We need to understand that there is a learning curve and that this is a different process to one that many people would have been used to. We, need, we aim to get across an understanding of why it's essential that we communicate well and respect each other's talents. But finally, and it's very importantly, we emphasise that we are there to support the academics to produce the courses that they want and that they will match the student needs. That's it, a very fist lightning course. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, please take a moment to listen to some of the other recording pre presentations delivered by my colleagues on different aspects of how we work at Coventry University. Any questions? Thanks, Ambrose, that was beautifully to time. Um, and um, and yeah, really, um, really interesting. I think such a valuable point about um, creating that um, working culture um, when you're working as a team, um, where kind of everybody um, is is respectful of the different expertise that um, that everybody's bringing to it. Um, I know that's a, a, something that's um, sometimes uh, sometimes tricky. Um, uh, Linda, you've got a a question, maybe. 
Well, I have, and it sort of picks up on that, that Leo. I, I wondered, Ambrose, because it was really very clear that you had grounded this in the idea of bringing on board and onboarding the academic colleagues, which clearly is very, very important. I wondered, what did you find that there were different disciplinary approaches that were needed there? Um, did How much contextualization in relation to the academics subject discipline was required in onboarding? Um, I think it's possibly fair to say that different disciplines are advantaged or disadvantaged in different ways, but I think there's probably more difference between academics themselves in, in, in different areas. Um, and, and certainly we, we, we aim to, to not come in with preconceptions because you can be surprised by someone for something that you wouldn't expect much web, web development knowledge can actually have lots. So I, I think, yeah, preconceptions should be avoided possibly. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Ambrose, are you working mostly with, with um, in terms of academics, um, academics who've taught mostly um, kind of blended um, on, and sort of kind of campus-based um, mode in the past? No, I mean, originally we were working very much with academics um, from campus and a, a campus environment. Obviously, over the last two years, everyone's been teaching hybrid and so we've got some experience of that. So, um, but yeah, generally we brought people in with no knowledge of online teaching. I think it's, um, this is something that's come up already um, a bit yesterday. Interesting that a lot of people's experience of moving to online teaching as a, a kind of an emergency model has been all about the synchronous lectures. And so do you find that that's a, a, a learning curve for people to think more about the um, more traditional approach to building online, online learning? Yes, I mean, I think the hybrid models, which which came in as a result of, of, of having to move to online, were very much around when to do the live sessions, how to do the live sessions, etc. But I think people realise very quickly that there's a lot of content and a lot of asynchronous activities that can be brought into play. Um, but it's learning how best to do that and how much the differences in scaffolding, etc., that have to be put in place to make sure that students can do it in a timely fashion in preparation for live sessions. Sometimes there's a little bit of thinking that has to go ahead or a different way of thinking that has to go into head to make that all fit together. And that's what we're there to help with. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's fantastic that you, that you are there to help them with that. Um, Linda is just reminding us that the full conference program is available on the web page. So we, we have got- um, That's the virtual conference as well. So we've got a, a number of recorded inputs, several from Coventry University, which we're delighted to have. And they complement the, uh, the live sessions that we have here. So talking about synchronous and asynchronous, uh, there's plenty going on there. Um, uh, I think, um, Leo, um, Anna Judd Yelland made a comment about, um, constructive alignment and, and academics not not generally familiar with that. Ambrose, has that been your your kind of experience as well? Uh, yes, I mean, I think um, I, I think it's quite interesting that when you go to online, everything's there, everything's evidenced. Um, and so people can look back and say, well, that wasn't there in the assignment and making sure that the triangle all comes together is, is really obvious online. So it's something that we really have to work with sort of thing to, to make sure that the sort of objectives and everything all fit together. You know, they, it, it, online, everyone can hear you scream rather than, <laughs> rather than no one. So it's, it, it, it certainly is something that we have to pay special attention to. Ambrose. Um, I think what we've had here today, Leo, I don't know if you would agree, but it's really, really interesting in way, the ways in which all of the presentations have foregrounded student-centred practices um, and innovation in relation to student-centred practices. So we can see, you know, on the, on the personal with Helen and Joe's work, on, on the understanding of complex complexity in, in, in Judy's um, input there 
in the design process that Ambrose and, and his team are working on. And then, of course, we started with, with Nicola's input, which was very much about making this work for the people involved, uh, the students and, and the staff. So um, I think that's quite quite a quite useful really um leo sorry I've, I've sort of stepped in there um that that a, a com a comment rather than a question but that's always always worthwhile from you linda so um <laughs> oh very diplomatically put I, there, yeah. I, um, I i really agree and i i do think that i mean i'm quite hopeful that this this is actually part of our pandemic learning um as a community around kind of online and blended learning that we are um that, that we are getting a, a better focus on what works for the people involved in doing it um, rather than um, being, um, you know, a bit, a bit more kind of um, about the de delivering as, um, as Ale was warning us against yesterday <laughs> in the opening keynote. And, and sorry, just re returning to your point, I, 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 um, I think it's really, it is really important that we, we um, not just that we're student centred, but also that we are always thinking about what is the, what works for staff, what is the impact on staff of our practices. Um, and and um, because, um, you know, as we've seen the, um, certainly in the pandemic era, it's been very overwhelming for people in a, in a situation that, um, where in higher education people have already been um, sort of towards overwhelmed for quite some time and um, and so that's that's obviously um, you know a, a, a cause for concern. Yeah, I think I think you're right I think the changes have been pretty mind-boggling to, to be honest that people have gone through and I think that's why we're trying to emphasize that we're here to support people to do what they need to do rather than impose change. <laughs> 